I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a Texas transplant who has always been in pursuit of art as a career. I've played in bands, pursued an acting career in Hollywood, but I found it behind the lens of a camera here in Dallas, Texas. I was born in New York, I've lived in Chicago, Los Angeles, Austin, but I love Dallas. There's a magical artistic scene in Dallas that mostly goes unnoticed to the outside world. This podcast is focused on what makes it so special and the people who make it thrive artistically. If you don't live here, and even if you do, you might not have heard of them. This is the Dallas Famous Podcast. This week on the Dallas Famous Podcast, my guest is Diana Cox. Diana may have grown up in the mid-cities, but she's all Dallas now. She started escaping to the Dallas music scene when she was 17. She went from playing in the punk band Sawed Off Stick and skating roller derby in the Dallas Derby Devil League to joining the Texas National Guard and then back to the music scene. Diana has been the director of operations of Kessler Presents for 10 years and is one of the main people behind the reopening of the historic Longhorn Ballroom. She still plays in a band with her husband called Station Wagon and even co-hosts her own podcast called The Devil's Trap Podcast. Please enjoy my chat with Diana Cox. Okay, we are back at the Kessler Theater actually sooner than I expected, with Diana Cox, who is your Kessler Presents, you're one of the team of Kessler Presents. Yeah, I'm a director of operations. Oh, so you're yeah. the boss. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, sometimes. So you're not just on the team, you're <laughs> leading the show. <sighs> That's cool. Sorta, for Kessler Presents, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, let's just start with that. Let's just start with, t- talk about Kessler Presents. Obviously, well, for those that don't know, the Kessler Theater is here in uh, Oak Cliff. Yeah. Yeah, so Kessler Presents is the operating company. We're the promoter behind the Kessler Theater. We also have the Heights Theater in Houston. We produce shows as Kessler Presents Austin. And we're the team behind uh, reopening the Longhorn Ballroom. Cool. Wait, so in Austin, what do you do? Uh, We work with partner venues there. We don't have our own venue, but we put shows on there. And um, so sometimes an artist wants to go, hey, I want to play Dallas, Houston, and Austin. And we're like, cool, we can do all three days. Oh, that's, yeah, that's handy. Um, You know, part of the show is sort of getting to know how things work. So mm-hmm. maybe take a second, like, how does that work? Like, you're in the office and, you know, you somebody's like, I want to put on a show. Like, they come to you, what happens? Oh, I direct them to the people that do the booking. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so now, once, basically, once a show is booked, um, I, I mean, I, I will take a little credit. I, I do get the opportunity to sometimes pitch um, artists. Um, I get a lot of opportunity to help propose um, opening artists for shows, uh, which is one of my great joys, especially if I can, you know, bring in someone from our local community or that I caught somewhere that put them on a bill. That's and then see them grow as an artist. That's just one of the coolest things I would say. But no, on a day to day, um, we've got um, people on our team that do the main booking for us. And then um, once the show is ready to roll, that's when it comes to my desk. And then we, our team kind of divvies up. We've got someone that does the ticketing, someone that does the marketing. And I'm like, kind of like, all right, we're gonna announce on this day. I sign the contract and all those kind of things. And and make sure it, it goes properly, everybody gets staff artists everybody gets paid what they're supposed to get paid everybody's happy at the end and then check all the numbers at the end of the day Mm, okay so So that's pretty a lot i like that this venue it's such a gorgeous venue um and it sounds fantastic and it's just really cool how you are definitely having local artists here all the time i mean it's cool to see a big artist here but for local artists this is like a stage like memorable show for them no i I agree i I think it's, it's it's such a cool balance where we'll have like a touring artist with you know, you know, thousands of you know, thousands and tens of thousands of followers and hits and records and all these things, one night and then the next night we'll have you know one of our beloved local regional artists that gets up there and is on that same stage sure. with a great audience too. It's just a really nice um, balance. I'd yeah, say. definitely. My first show here, I got to shoot uh, Rhett Miller solo, oh, which yeah. of course you know local favorite. Of course. But uh, that was cool because, you know, um, I used to live in L.A. And so not that I wasn't in venues where you could in- mingle, but it just it just felt different here specifically where it's just like, oh, there's Rhett hanging out in the lobby. Right. And let's just all, you know, mix it up. It was cool. It was, and, and yeah. Anyway, um, I got way ahead. Yeah, it's all right. Let's get to know <laughs> you a little bit. Let's start sure. with you. Are you a Texan? I am. I am. First generation. Yeah. Tonight. Dallas or? I grew up in the, I grew up in Bedford. So I'm from the suburbs in the middle. Okay. Between Dallas and Fort Worth. DFW. And uh, yeah. And then, um. You know, growing up, I um, you know, super suburbia, but at the same time, I thought it was like 
something that really great because I could get to Fort Worth or Dallas at any given time, you know, it's pretty easy to get to both cities. And, and you know, I'm, I'm obviously very Dallas now, but, uh, <laughs> yes. but there's great things in, in our whole Metroplex area. And that's a really, oh, yeah. we're really lucky, I think overall to have like cities like this with the contrast, but also it draws so much more of everything of arts and culture to have you know, Dallas, Fort Worth and even Denton. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll say it, but you know, it's, yeah. it, it adds it adds a lot to us, I think here. So, so okay, so you're growing up in mid, yeah. mid city, mid we'll cities. Call it. Oh yeah. And uh, how, what's your introduction to like realizing I love music? It's not just a thing like that people do. I love. Yeah. This. So for my, uh, I mean, so it wasn't my first concert ever. That was Garth Brooks at the old Texas Stadium, <laughs> but uh, with the pretty legendary shows he did there. Nice. But the. Um, for my 15th birthday, my dad took me to see the Toadies at, in Fort Worth at Will Rogers. Mm. And um, the openers were Brutal Juice and Civ, who Brutal Juice is another legacy local band from, uh -huh. and this is the 90s. So they've been playing for a while, not to out, I'm sure everybody knows how old they are at this point. <laughs> right. um, and uh, we had floor tickets and me and my friend were, went down in the front and bopping around and I thought it was the coolest thing. And that was when it just hit me like, this is it. This is this live music and the rock and roll and all of that just blew my mind, that experience. And I, sure. You know, it, it you know, got knocked around a little bit, which always like, you know, when you first get that little shove in a little mosh pit and when you're a little angsty teen <laughs> is a special moment <laughs> right. that you don't forget. Um, uh, <clears throat> and that was kind of like the launch of it for me. I guess like within, you know, a year or two, I was the, the girl with the station wagon that had permission to drive to Deep Ellum out of all of her friends. And as long as I answered my pager, if mom and dad paged, <laughs> then and got home by curfew, uh, I could drive my friends and we could go to the all ages punk rock shows. Nice. And so I was doing that within a couple of years. Of okay, so you yeah, that's you the cool friend for sure, <laughs> the cool parents at least. Well, my my parents were into music and, you know, they they That's they important. Like that, that yeah. you know, that's the thing that's like that yeah, if your parents aren't into it, you're fighting the whole time, yeah. which I know some people become great artists because of that oh, too. Yeah. So you're going to concerts. Yeah. Do you did you play music ever? I you know I, at that point in my life, no. I had done dance. I did do band briefly in junior high. It was not my thing. Mm. Um, what instrument? No, oh, they they assigned me the bassoon. Oh, they assigned. Oh, you're that person. So, yeah, I was that girl. You're so like picked last in band, basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so I, I did. I mean, I did choirs and things like that, uh -huh. but I wasn't making music at that point in my life at all. Um, you know, I just was really into into going to shows and that experience of it. That was the whole thing, sure. and you know, and getting in, you know, being a little rebellious with shave, you know, shaving my head and going oh. to wash pits and you know, hanging out at. You have photos of this? Oh yeah. Here? Oh, oh yeah. god, yeah. I'm curious yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> they, they changed the school dress code because of me for that for one year. You know? Oh, like, wow. Yeah. That's a badge of honor. Yeah. You know, maybe not so much in Texas. One. I feel like everybody did. I don't know. I didn't grow up it here. Was, just, like, no, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty good. I was pretty proud of it for a little bit. Nice. I was mad, but then I was real proud. Yeah, <laughs> it was one of those. Honestly, I was like, <laughs> yeah, that story is better than. I was like, oh, they specifically listed pink as an unacceptable hair color. That's because of me. Wow. <laughs> wow. I wonder if they changed that. It's gone. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. No, now they don't care. They're like, just show up to school, kids, please, for the love of God. <laughs> So. Right. <laughs> right. So, so, okay. So you're, then you went to college? Yeah. So I, I went to school. I, I did what I call the tour of North Texas colleges. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so I kind of also gotten into like a little bit of like, like the rave scene at that point. So I went from like little, little club punk rock shows, at Orbit Room Galaxy Club. Uh, and uh, then we kind of got a little bit of electronica kind of rave scene, which was still like where you called the phone number to find out where the party was kind of days before <laughs> right. it was like at a club club. Uh -huh. um, but I still always loved going to live shows. And um, I went to Texas Wesleyan for a couple of years, Took, did a little bit of time at UTA and Tarrant County College and ended up at UT Dallas. Okay. Uh, that's where I, I wrapped up at. Okay. And were you doing music related stuff at school? You know, not at school. I, actually, I, I, you know, I did some photography, but it wasn't my... Um, I learned that I was not going to be a digital photographer, and that was the way of the future. And so, I and I was not going to be professionally a film photographer. So okay. I kind of moved on. It was a really um, beloved hobby, but it's not something I do anymore. Uh, but I did a little bit of that in school. But no, I, actually, I was really interested in radio and TV. That was my jam. Oh, like, okay. that was what I thought I was going to go do, which is kind of interesting in some ways now. But um, no, I, I, I 
kept going to school and bouncing around and kind of just got to the point where I'm like, whatever, I'm closest to having my degree and that is my degree. <laughs> Don't right. care. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I finished my bachelor's and went and got a job like you do in, mm-hmm. in between, like, you know, scheduling like – Oh, where do I want to live? I want to live in Dallas, even though I don't work in Dallas at that time because sure. I was hanging out and going to shows. Sure. Um, it's around the time I started playing roller derby. So I was with the Dallas Derby Devils. Oh, um, cool. And uh, yeah. So <laughs> this is where I get a little more into music world. Okay. Uh, so um, I am um, with that. We uh, a couple of the girl, one of the girls I played with, we got recruited by a local band to just like do like some go-go dance and some backing vocals on um, one show. Mm -hmm. And that actually turned into being invited to be in the band as a regular member of the band. This was Sawed Off Sick is, was the name of the band. Um, I also got to do a little bit of the band booking for some of the roller derby events. So I'd kind of, because I've been going to shows and I had met bands because I really was out. I I was out a lot. (laughs) So, (laughs) um, and so, so I, I got to do that and it was, um, you know, we um, we had a lot of fun. We didn't do like a lot of touring, but we were playing in Deep Ellum um, at a you know Dark Side Lounge, which was a, a once upon a time small venue next to the Elm Street Bar, and um, got to play at Trees, mm. uh, which was cool. And then um, you know somewhere around there is where uh, um, Lagrange opened. Uh, we played there, which is now where Three Links is located. Mm-hmm. Um, and around that time, though, I kind of did the, uh, huh, my, uh, my career's not really doing what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm going to go back to school. And so I did. I went, I went back and, um, to study um, political science. And that's what um, I got my master's at U- UTD okay. with that. And in the middle of my master's program, I also decided that I really wanted to have a different experience in life and I should join the military. So I joined the Texas Army National Guard. I did uh, not see that coming. So, so I went to Army basic training in my late 20s, which is an experience. Um, and were, what, what, what made you think of that? Like you're in going to punk and, and these, these shows, like what made you think of the military? Well, so I think it's, you know, a, a variety of things. First of all, the, the State National Guard program is very much centered on... Um, services to the state right oh, it okay. is like it's, when there's floods when there's disasters like type stuff. when a lot of that type of stuff but also they are part of the army um i mean that they, they go overseas just mm. like anybody else in the military can um and for me i felt i've all i'm i'm very pro-military family so mm-hmm. that's where i come from regardless okay. i mean yeah, there's yeah. not a lot i mean we kind of aren't we don't have like a huge military legacy before, but we do have several people in my family that have been, and it's always been something I've been proud of and kind of thought it was neat. And um, it had crossed my mind before, but I was like, there's no way I could do that. Uh-huh. And uh, and then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna prove it to myself that I can do it. Uh, so I went in as an officer candidate because uh, because I had my degree and, uh-huh. and did officer school. And wow. I, you know, and people had to call me ma'am. It was really weird. Uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah, so I, I was doing that and finished school, and I taught at Tarrant County College, where I had attended before. After that, after wow. I got out with all that, okay, uh, and that's where it kind of comes around back to Lagrange. Uh, one of my dear friends was the owner of Lagrange, and um, we um, and she has an awesome rum distillery now, by the way, down in Dripping Springs. Mm. If you're into that, mm. but uh, we. Um, I started helping out with her business. Just I was teaching. I had the National Guard going. So I had stuff going. But I was like, hey, I can help do some day-to-day stuff and some events, you know, when there's a private event or whatever and pick up a couple, you know, bartender cafe shifts. Sure, you know, Mm -hmm. having like four jobs, no big deal. Uh, So (laughs) I was doing that. And um, it kind of came about that that they were going to be getting ready to – that they were closing. And and Mm. it was – you know, that was the decision that was made at that time. And so um, we continued, though, doing some pop-up event work on our own through just get small little contracts here and there, um, me and, and my friend Stephanie and another girl. We were doing these little pop-up events. And uh, through that, she actually got connected with Edwin, um, and who um, the owner of the Kessler, mm. uh, and basically I got roped we all we got roped into doing events and then from there it was like 
no, no, you need to be here full time. So, <laughs> so your, the Kessler was already established at that point. The Kessler was open. Yeah, this okay. was about twenty. This would have been twenty thirteen when I joined the team. So okay. the Kessler opened in twenty ten, and then I joined the team in twenty thirteen. Okay, wow. So you've been here pretty much the whole time, more or less. Right. Close, close yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. ten years now. <laughs> this the, year, ten years. Wow. Congrats. Yeah. Is is the heights? Crazy. Where do the heights come in, like time wise? The Heights Theater we opened in uh, twenty seventeen. Hmm. Sixteen or seventeen. Okay. Oh, yeah. I swear, like my concept of years, I, yeah, COVID, okay. COVID it ruined that. Oh, I'm like, what yes. year is it? I don't know. Yeah, because like, we kind just, of just didn't count. There's just two years that years. just disappeared. Yeah. Did nothing. Yeah. yeah. It's but, strange. but yeah, we we opened that down in Houston. Um, yeah, about just over. I guess we're having six years now. So, can you take us like a sidestep and give yeah. us a little bit of history of how the Kessler became the the music venue it is now? Because I know it was a it was a movie theater, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the history of the the building itself. um, So the Kessler Theater is the National Historic Registry. It was built in 1941 Mm. as a movie house, movie house era. Um, During that time, Gene Autry was one of the owners, the famous singing cowboy from Oklahoma. Um, And uh, but like most movie houses of that time, post-World War II, kind of started closing down. Um, One of the what is believed to be benefits of why this property didn't get torn down like so many movie houses of that era is the storefronts because if you come to the Kessler you come usually just enter on the corner and you see like oh yeah there's we're in the Kessler but if you look on the Davis street side we have there's storefronts there mm-hmm. there's businesses there right and so it's not just a standalone theater it had other interesting pieces so to that's it. how it was spared that's basically. what's that's the 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 part of the belief of why it, it's made it this far okay. um it was um you know kind of it started getting used as, as a revivalist church um but at some point in there it did get hit by the tornado of 1957 mm-hmm. a very famous tornado that hit dallas um you can actually see uh, if you look at the aerial photos the line like it cut straight across the building it's wow. wild i saw pictures of the building but yeah, yeah. i didn't see that one and if you ever are on our green space out back which is sometimes we've hosted some little outdoor shows there you if you look up at the brick wall you can see a kind of a u-shape across the back where the brick color is slightly different and that's uh, actually where the tornado cut through. Interesting. You can okay. see that across the back of the building. Um, but yeah, and then they, they rebuilt, though. Uh, and then it did uh, have a fire in the early 60s. Uh-huh. Uh, that was, um, didn't obviously, you know, it, it didn't fully gut the building, but it was not good. Um, and then um, the Revelous Church moved on <laughs> shortly after that uh-huh. is the story. So uh, it was used as, you know, like an embroidery shop, storage, a few other things, kind of just miscellaneous purposes for 30 plus years. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of wasn't a fully used property um, until until it was uh, purchased by uh, our owner who, who right. uh, decided that. It needed to be revitalized. And did he? Something. Did he see it and say, you know, this would be a good place for a music venue? That was yeah. always the idea. Okay, that was the plan. Yeah, I have to music, talk to him and get his. Yeah, story. music and events, and um, um, uh, it was used as a dance studio as well. I mean, uh, the uh, the wood floors uh, in in the theater are sprung, so you can actually, so it's good for oh, dancing. Okay. Uh, so I know we do a lot of seated shows, but we do have right. some standing. I was say, and it's actually have, like, a sprung floor. Swing shows with dancing, and yeah. you could do that. I guess. But yeah, not that you need help. <laughs> Feeling nice here. Um, uh, yeah. So, so you've been here ten years. Some of your favorite moments at this venue? Uh, I was like, I'm like, so I'll, I'll try to name a few. That's always a, such a loaded one. question. Sure. Um, you know, I think I will say just a couple standout shows of of touring artists that just like blew me away, um, or were just really special experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, we had John Batiste. That was amazing. Whoa. We had, and he did in the round in the middle of the room. It was oh, killer. But just time out. More of that that type of show, <laughs> by the way. I guess it's up to the artist, but that uh, is sure. The, yeah, I'd love to. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. Um, and Mavis Staples. Um, what is amazing? Wow. Amazing show. Like goose, you know, goose full goosebumps. Um, you know, I've gotten to see you know Billy Joe Shaver. Gotten to do, um, you know, but all the way over to the other end of the spectrum. Laura Jane Grace played mm. here, um, and um, I, I guess you know, there's just so many um, um, cool touring shows. But then you also get the other side of the coin when I get to see like the locals that mm-hmm. we like, and so that's I think the other side that's just really exciting to see, and um, you know, like 
name drop my Joshua Ray Walker, mm-hmm. Vandaliers, um, sure. and then um, you know seeing you know Summer Dean. I mean, we've just yeah. had so many it's really cool. Like obviously that's more on the countryside, but I mean we've also put on. Henry the Archer and other things that are just really unique, um, fun shows, a little more rockin'. I know mm-hmm. we do a lot of um, quote unquote Americana music, sure. but you know, English beat. That's, I mean, uh, how fun is that? What? Like, I yeah, missed that one. Oh. Yeah. So we've gotten some really cool, fun stuff that's just been just always a good experience. I, I yeah. don't know. I feel like it's an experience, and yeah. that's the difference. I don't know. My first time being here, I was working on that show, the Shadow Music yeah. Showcase, and it was The Fox and the Hound. and yeah creamer neither band are together but jacob metcalf yep. was here who works here still and does he's got he's, a solo thing he's our venue manager he was oh right right yeah. he was so funny um because we were these guys from hollywood which i'm not very hollywood if you know me <laughs> but they didn't know that and he was i don't know what was happening at first but i was tasked with going over there and trying to convince him to put a like a piece of tape on his eyes out or whatever he had <laughs> And he was just giving me grief about it. And then he wanted, I mean, he wasn't, he was being very nice, but he oh, was in yeah. the, the contract. Always. He's like, can, you know, like I need to talk to my lawyer and this and that. And I just was like sitting with him patient. And then at a certain point, like, I think it was 20 minutes. And he's like, you know what? I trust you. I like you. And he just put the tape on. He signed the thing. I was like, I, who is this guy? <laughs> I freaking uh, love no. that dude. Yeah, no, he's yeah. awesome. And, and he's an amazing artist in his own oh, right, too. Yeah. You know, I, I love working with him, but he's yeah, such a good artist. And we we're he got to have his album release here just a few months ago. Mm-hmm. And it was, in addition to being entertaining, it was visually stunning, which is right. why I think he probably was very particular about something like that. But yeah, that's, absolutely. yeah. so no, that's, that was, it's definitely, um, you know, a, 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 we've got to do some really cool stuff here like that. Okay, so coming up very soon. In fact, I think you mentioned uh, after you take a short break, you're going to be <laughs> headlong into the Longhorn Ballroom yeah. situation. So why don't you get us going on that? Yeah, so uh, I think it's been, you know, um, a lot of local news has covered that that our uh, Kessler Presents is behind the reopening of the Longhorn Ballroom. And so um, I won't harp just on that portion, but basically, yeah, we've um, – I've been in progress of, of renovating the Longhorn Ballroom. It was, you know, uh, such a historic spot that is, and I'll say to everybody like, oh, of course, you know, Sex Pistols and Merle Haggard. Mm-hmm. That's the sign that everybody knows, right, right? right? That is the sign. And it's really cool. There is nothing sure. uncool about that. I'm like, how much more freaking rock and roll can you get than right. that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so no, we're, we're super excited and um, having our, our, uh, opening weekend announced is big deal mm-hmm. and you know paying definitely paying homage to those um that played you know have the legacy of the place and who's played there before yeah. kicking off i yeah. mean I, I mean how could you not kick it off with a sleep at the wheel <laughs> that's, right that's, but it's just so cool like you know that's something that's one of the reasons that, that i started this podcast is like i am not from dallas so the yeah. history of dallas to me is fascinating yeah. and the more i learn the more i'm interested and yeah. it's so cool to be able to bring a venue like that back i mean the fact that it wasn't torn down like if we were in california that would have been torn down so long ago well it's been lucky you know there's been you know there has been iterations and attempts at at, at bringing it back and um it, it's you know there are challenges with a property of that size and it's being big. a very real estate centric city yeah, um, yeah. there are challenges but you know um we're we're real lucky to have gotten the support and and um been able to pursue it i think it's i think it's just a really big deal for the city and you know you talk about like the history of a place like that it's obviously we've got a soft spot for historical venues as a, as a company and a brand and all of that mm-hmm. i mean the heights theater is a historic movie house as well oh, okay <laughs> so which also had an arson actually and got burned down and oh. that's, a, that's houston stories though yeah, we won't no, tell we too many of those but um <laughs> but um <laughs> the longhorn's a little different in that it wasn't a movie house it's always been a music venue mm-hmm. and so you know for our, as much amazing history as our as the Kessler and the Heights have. It's not like, oh, all these, you know, we've got amazing artists that have played here, but it's not 50 years of amazing sure, artists. Sure, sure. It's, you know, it's 10 to 15 years of, yeah. it, from thir- you know, about amazing artists. And that's about it. So when we look at Longhorn, it's, you know, yeah, you can talk about, you know, it was built as Bob Wills Ranch House. That's what it was built for, huh. for him to play, for Bob Wills. Okay. And like Western Swing. Boom. Huh. But, you know, uh, through over time, it, it it grew away from that. And obviously, name was changed to Longhorn. But, you know, it's 
it's got a rock and roll legacy. It's got a soul legacy. Mm-hmm. It's got all of those things. It's just such a place where so like you've got your rock and rollers that have been there. You've got your your Latin artists that have been there. You've got, you know, um, the soul and R&B African-American artists that have been there. And then, of course, of course, you've got your old school country. I yeah. mean, that's a given. It's crazy, though, it's the, the amount of variety. I mean, yeah, there's venues like that in other places, but. I mean, it just seems like certain shows, not just those shows, but I, I've heard of other shows too, okay. that people just mark their life before and after. Yeah. I just had uh, Bubba Flint who yeah. does, you know, uh, cartoons. And he said that the Sex Pistol shows, he's like, I actually was there. I'm okay. one of the people that really was there. He's like, after that, my art changed. Cause I was like, there's no restrictions. Like right. there's no rules. And I just yeah. think that's so cool. Like how the, you know, how the arts are affecting each other. Well, yeah, and I think you know, um, I don't know. There's, there's a, people have feelings about the Sex Pistols mm-hmm. because we can. There's a lot of <clears throat> opinions as to whether they're actually a good band or not, oh, and 100%. all of those kind of things. Sure. And, and without even getting into that, I mean, because I, I can have that debate. And yes, I had my little, you know, my mm-hmm. little eighth grade Diana had her Never Mind the Bollocks T-shirt going to go skateboard <laughs> with her friends. But, <laughs> but also looking back, I'm kind of like, oh. I do not want to listen to that album today. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's agreed. fine. Yeah. But I think it represented something. Their tour uh-huh. really did for music. And and you t- and there's there's conversations about like were there punk bands in Texas before they played? Sure there were. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm just I'm saying Texas centric cuz that's where we're sitting at, not sure. because that's all that matters. But right, no. but yeah, there were. But we're I think it it opened up the tent and opened up the awareness about mm-hmm. that type of music and and about that that rebellious spirit. And I think that that was a really and and just put it in a different light and, and direction. I think that's cool. Sure. Yeah. I mean, because if you're in a punk band, you're in this little circle. If you're just going along, you know, you heard of this band I'm with the Sex Pills, I want to check them out. Yeah. That's a whole bunch of people that didn't know what they were walking into, maybe yeah. or to some extent. No, yeah, no, for sure. So I think I think it's a I think it was you know it was pivotal in in that historic way, even if it's not necessarily influential in that way. Sure, not necessarily. Like, I feel like if you're a 17 <laughs> year old kid at that show, you don't care about anything but how, how amazing it is. Exactly. We can talk about the other stuff after the fact. I, I agree <laughs> with you on a lot of that, but I I, I I can only imagine what it must have been like if you're a kid in Same. that room. Yeah. yeah, I can't either. Yeah, it's wild. Well, let's. Let's talk some more about you. Okay. We're pretty much getting to the Ooh, end. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I know that you, let's, so, so other stuff you do. I know you have a yeah. podcast. Yeah. So, um, well, my husband and I have been doing music off and on for the last few years. Okay. So uh, we did have a project called Station Wagon, which is uh, punk covers, but we're not, we, we're, we, that, that's changed. That's, and so now we're working on some duo stuff. Did it's you record in the mix. Uh, well, it was all, it was all street punk co- or like skate punk covers. So, I mean, I could put not, that stuff on the uh, radio. Yeah. Well, well, I'll see if they can dig a couple up. Okay. Um, uh, we did a little bit of recording, but not a ton. Um, but so we're working on some stuff. And then um, I do a podcast with one of my friends. It's called Devil's Trap Podcast. And uh, it's about the TV show Supernatural. Mm. She's a super fan. And I'm watching one episode at a time. And Oh, you hadn't along. seen it? Never. Oh. So I'm like, every week is new to me. God, when you were telling me about it, I'm like, oh, why? That's interesting. You're such a fan. Like, you're not even the fan. She's the fan. Yeah, she's the fan. That's great. She okay. Talked about it. That's so, more interesting than So just... I'm reacting in real, like, in quote unquote real time, you know, each sure, week. Each sure. week. Um, and then um, and then I'm in the car club, Them. Uh, we put on the Invasion Car Show in Deep Ellum every year uh, where we shut down Elm Street. It's, on, uh-huh. um, it's usually a it used to be over Labor Day weekend, and then we all decided that was too hot. Mm-hmm. So it's in September. Okay. So we, we do that, the, all pre-64 cars in Deep Ellum That's every year. great. And then when um, when's the first show at Longhorn? March 30th. Awesome. And then last thing, tell us where we can find you. What of your, is there stuff we can find you anywhere? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, my, my Instagram's out there. It's Diana Slick. But um, we got a, a my, you can follow Devil's Trap Podcast. I don't really do have any other professional social media mm-hmm. out there. So okay. that's kind of it for me right now. Okay. I kind of hide behind the scenes a little bit. Sometimes they let me like, you, I, know, you know, what's interesting to me is it's, I feel like it's on the one hand being a performer or being in the scene makes you a better it's your job you know no. running a show but at the same time I find it interesting like i didn't expect you to like i have a podcast but i also am behind the scenes like most people are one <laughs> or the other so right that's pretty cool i do i try to do a little bit of both i mean you know a little privacy sometimes but also yeah. i like it i don't i'm not scared to get out there but i also like a obviously here we are <laughs> so it's nice yeah. balance well i i love what you guys do here and i cannot thanks. wait for longhorn ballroom to open awesome. so diana thanks for sitting with me yeah thank you so much I'd like to thank Diana Cox for inviting me back to the Kessler. 
Salim Narawab gave us our theme song, Unstoppable. You can check out the Dallas Famous Podcast every week, Sundays and Tuesdays on Deep Elm Radio at 1 p.m. and then on all the podcast places. Check us out next week.